Thank you very much. And thank you to the PyCon for, for hosting us and organizing this great event. It's been wonderful. Okay, last talk. We'll make it. 3D graphics. Virtual reality is a big thing right now. At this point, we can track a, a screen that's mounted on, your, on, on someone's head, have them move around, have the, have a, and have a 3D virtual world update relative to their, to their, in front of their eyes so that they feel like they're in a different space. This is awesome. It doesn't have to be in front of their eyes. You can also project uh, the 3D virtual world onto the walls around them. This is called a cave system. We do this in uh, neuroscience with, uh, with flies. This is a fly be being tracked and a virtual world being, uh, being tracked around the fly. And the, the fly actually avoids uh, cylinders, uh, virtual cylinders in space. We're using these kinds of systems in neuroscience to understand how vision works, how the the the, the spatial navigation works in uh, in rodents, in fish, even. And I had to build one for for my own lab, and which I ended up calling Rat Cave. I had to figure out how to, to take a projection from a video projector and from the perspective of, in this case, a camera, look like an object was floating inside the arena, so that way we could we could manipulate the world around the, around the rat. And it turned out, in order to do this, I had to start from the very beginning. I had to start from knowing how to project, how to take a single 3D point and put it somewhere on a 2D screen so to, to give the right projection. And that's what I want to talk about today, how, how the math works for, for 3D graphics so that we can kind of get a better understanding of what OpenGL is doing and what these, these powerful 3D engines are doing um, in, in order to be able to maybe use them to their full capabilities. And of course, we're going to use that, do all that using Python. There are many game engines in Python right now and uh, OpenGL uh, uh, wrappers. Pyglet and Pygame are really popular, as is uh, Arcade, which uses Pygame. There's some 3D engines as well. PyOgre and Panda 3D exist. And um, there's even PyOpenGL, which lets you go straight to, straight to uh, OpenGL and call, call OpenGL things from the lowest level. Um, I think there was even a, a, a Steam release last week of Python game on Steam. So, it's, you know, Python gaming is a pretty big thing. No, it's not a very big thing, but it's, it's nice. Uh, today I'm going to show you a package that I made for, for our system. It's called RatCave. It's an it's a, a extension utility that, that takes an existing OpenGL context and adds 3D, 3D objects. So, so it performs the math for you. And I'm also going to demonstrate VizPy, which is another, uh, another low-level wrapper. This is really powerful and easy to use. In order to get started with the 3D thing, we need to start with 2D. And so we're, I'm going to start out by making an OpenGL context using a Python package called Pyglet. So there's going to be some live coding today. Um, I'm going to start with using Atom. I'm going to make a file called cube or monkey.py. Because I'm going to project a monkey in space. The first thing we got to do is make a window. Pyglet contains an object called window. We can make a Pyglet window by using its by its window object, and, we, and, and when I run this this uh, this script, what you'll see is the window will appear and then it'll disappear really fast. This is because well, actually, it's so fast we can't even see it. <laughs> fast. It's because uh, the window object gets created, the, um, and then Python reaches the end and it exits the same way as it does with every script. So we need a, an event loop to kind of keep it going. We could use a while loop, but then we wouldn't be able to do anything else. For example, if I do while true, maybe we can kind of naively start like this. A window pops up, but it's, we, can't, we can't call anything inside of the while loop. Instead, what I'm going to do is use an, um, an event loop. And uh, Pyglet comes with one called app.run. One of the nice benefits here is that if I hit the escape key, I can close my application. So that's already, it's already taking some keyboard input. So that's a good start. I also want to be able to, um, to build on this and to build an application. And I'm going to use an object oriented style, but you're not forced to for, for Pyglet because I want to show how, how it's related to VizPy. So instead of doing it like this, I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to say, let's make an app object. And let's inherit from window instead. Uh, 
at this point, we're in the same boat. Everything's good to go. Now, if we want to, we can actually draw, we can actually draw onto this already. Um, all the window objects, they provide callback functions that start with on, just like a lot of graphics packages. And for example, uh, in the on draw, uh, method, if you call something like draw a color, which is a function that I provide in Rat Cave, so I'm already gonna do this so we don't have to call the OpenGL, the OpenGL function. 255, zero, zero means red, green, blue. It's gonna be red. And red pops up. So this is already pretty great. Just anything we pop up, we put into the onDraw function is gonna be, is gonna happen, uh, whenever the, the screen refreshes. The, the, yeah. So that's good. Now we have an OpenGL context. What's next? Well, next we have to put 3D data onto the screen. 3D data is essentially position data. Every uh, we have we, uh, every 3D object, a mesh is made up of a multitude of 3D points called vertices. Every vertex is an x y z coordinate because th three 3D. That's the, those are the 3Ds, x y and z. Um, depending on the order order you put them in, you can draw edges between. You can you can make OpenGL understand that there are lines connecting them if they're next to each other. Or that there are tri that they're involved in a triangle called a face, and as you and as you 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 put these up next to each other in an array, you eventually build up your full mesh. So all you need to do is supply your vertex data in the right order that the, the, the triangles will get made. Once you've got that happening, you need to actually position it somewhere in space. This is this is a single mesh, a single cube centered around zero 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 zero. Um, in order to move around space, the, the typical uh, approach is to use um, um, uh, matrix multiplication. And the solution, and you'll see why in a minute, is to, to change a 3D object into a 4D object, to add a W. Usually the W is centered at 1. It's called homogeneous coordinates. It's, it's done to make, uh, make all the matrix multiplication that's needed really efficient and easy to use. What you do is you, you take your, your each vertex position, Oh, sorry, you start out here, your vertex position, Mo rescale it by multiplying it along the diagonal by how, how much you want it to scale. If you want it to be big, you can multiply everything by a certain value. Rotate in space. We, these are, each of these is a, is a 2D rotation in space along three axes. It's called Euler, Euler rotations. And then, whoops. And then multiplying it by translation. When you put an x, y, z coordinate here, you shift everything in the, co the corresponding space, depending on where that, that, that is. Once you've multiplied all these together, you end up with a new position in a new space. This is called model space. And when you multiply them all together, these three, these, these all together, well, you're, you're building a new four by four matrix called the model matrix. One model matrix can be applied to all of your vertices. This makes this really this is good for parallel processing. You make one model matrix, you have tons of vertices, each one can be multiplied by one model matrix. Let's see how that looks. I'm gonna start out by doing all this in IPython. Because I want to oh uh, well, actually let's let's use Blender first. Yeah. Let's use Blender. Blender is an um, a th um, a open source um, free 3D modeling uh, program. Um, it's used to build 3D objects and uh, manipulate them, and even make movies and games and all kinds of kinds of really cool things. I recommend trying it out, especially because it has a Python scripting interface. In Blender, a, a single mesh looks like like this. This is a cube, right? You can delete it, which I'm going to do, and replace it with a monkey named Suzanne. Suzanne can be rescaled. And if I, we look at the data associated with it, we see that even though I'm rescaling it, uh, I'm pointing to my screen, it's terrible. The, uh, the location data hasn't changed, but the scale data has changed. So as you go up, um, up and down, you see that the scale, scale moves. As I move Suzanne around, just the location moves. Suzanne is made up of multiple vertices. 
if we go into Blender's edit mode, you can see those vertices here. Each of these is one vertex. Finally, um, you can you can map um, each of these vertices onto a 2D image. If you wanted to take a flat image and say which vertex should be associated with that flat image, you can do something called UV mapping. I'm going to do that really quick, and I'll explain that later. In order to work with this data, um, what you have to do is export it into some kind of file. And there are lots of different 3D file types. For example, the one I'm going to use is called Wavefront. It ends in .obj. I'm just going to save it to, to my desktop here. And I'll call this monkey.obj. Oh, and there's all kinds of modifications. For Rat Cave, we need to triangulate our faces. Just make, make sure it's all in triangle order. And that's just fine. What does that make? Well, if I open up monkey.obj in the text editor, somehow, buff. Well, Adam is a text editor. I can use that. This is the kind of file you get. This O is the name of, name of the full mesh, and every line underneath it is one vertex. See? X, Y, Z. The order of them defines, defines what the, uh, each of these is a unique vertex, and wavefront files actually compress the data in their F by grabbing the, in, the corresponding index for each vertex in order. So each of these sets is a triangle. We have three different sets of information, vertex, texture coordinate, and normal information, which I'm going to explain in a minute. And all of them are associated with each other in order to make these triangles. To load this in, in Python, I'm just going to import rat cave. Here, I'll make a reader object for that file, monkey.obj, and I'll get the mesh out of that object. Get mesh monkey. Or Suzanne. <laughs> and we've loaded it. There's a lot of data associated with it. See that the position is wherever it was by by default in the in the um, wherever I moved it in space. Oh, it, it's just, it's it's this average vertex space. Um, we have our rotation information here, and we can see that data as um, matrices by saying two matrix. Now this isn't very pretty because NumPy is not making it very pretty. So I'll set print options to just just round things. Now if we look at it, it's a little bit nicer. This is the XYZ position of the average vertex position of these of this object. For the rotation, you get the same the same thing. You've got a four by four matrix representing the rotation. Currently there's no rotation applied. But if I do a, uh, rotate it, let's say along the, the X axis and give it a 90 degree rotation we look at the new rotation, we'll see that, that these have changed. Okay, The model matrix is built up by multiplying the scale, rotation, and uh, translation. So what I can do is just say, well, I'll say m equals monkey, just to shorten it. m dot position. To get, the, uh, to get the model matrix, I'll say position to matrix, matrix multiply, Python 3 feature, yeah, two matrix multiplied by the scale. And this is our, our model matrix. Of course, um, Rackdave provides a model matrix property. That's the same thing. So this, uh, so this, is, where, this is where it is in space. It's defining how to transform all those vertices to position it somewhere into a virtual world. Um, yeah, so I'm going to add that code into into uh, the, this, uh, this application just to load the object. I'll say monkey equals rat caves wavefront reader monkey dot obj get mesh Suzanne. I'm going to place it at the oh, dot xyz at the zero coordinate, 
the negative three Z position. That's because by default, conven uh, convention is that uh, our camera is looking in the negative Z direction. So this puts, puts us right in front of, front of us in the screen. However, we haven't defined what, what the camera actually is yet. So let's talk about that. We still need to get to the point where we're actually positioning it somewhere on our screen. Right now, it's just in some virtual space. That's where we get the view matrix and the projection matrix. These are both 4x4 four four matrix matrices. One is the inverse of the model matrix that describes where everything is relative to a camera. And the, the reason it's an inverse is the same reason that, that um, things move left in your visual scene when you move right. Um, it's, the, it's, ex it's exactly the opposite of whatever an object is moving. For that reason, actually, OpenGL doesn't pr provide a concept of a camera. It just provides, you, you end up actually moving the world around the viewer rather than moving a camera to something. And finally, we have to figure out how to flatten it down onto a 2D screen. This is called the projection matrix. This here is the algorithm for a, pr a perspective projection, to project everything down as if it was going onto a single point. It does that by grabbing um, a rectangular-ish area and flattening it. This area is called the frustrum, and everything inside the frustrum gets drawn. To finally, to, to finally take the model matrix, the, the, the vertex, and bring it down to, to the screen, you, then what you have to do is, is some more model, uh, matrix multiplication. You take the original position, this original vertex, vertex data, multiply it by the model matrix to say where it is in, in the virtual world, multiply it by the view matrix to say where it is relative to the viewer, then multiply it by the projection matrix to say where it is on the screen. This is called, creatively, the model view projection matrix. Let's see the model view projection matrix. In Ratcave, we have an, uh, a, 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 a camera object. Camera. And we, can, and we can, it has position and rotation just like everything else. It also has a view matrix. If I move the object to the positive three, the, the camera to the positive three position, its model matrix, where it is in space, is in the positive x position. That's this positive three right here. If we move it, but if we look at its view matrix, we see that it's at the negative three position. This is helping to define everything in, in, in its position. So we use cameras view matrices in order to define everything relative to a camera. Finally, cameras have projection objects. And projection objects have projection matrices. And by default, that's, this is that perspective projection. You can also have orth or orthographic projections and all kinds of projections. If you change the projections, for example, field of view to something really massive, like 170 degrees, the projection matrix will change. But the view matrix and model matrix will not, because the camera is still in the same position. That way we have independent manipulations where the objects are, where you're viewing them from, and how they go down onto the screen by separating them into three different matrices. Let's draw the monkey. Well, the, the, only, the final thing is that we need to actually tell the OpenGL, tell our graphics card to use that, to use that, um, manipula use that multiplication in order to actually draw them. This is d done using something called a shader program. Recave provides um, a default shader that a lot of people just can use. And so what I'm going to do, actually, is bind it by saying, R with a default shader, draw the monkey. In order to, um, in order to do the camera, we have a default camera as well, but I'll just make a camera object right here. And the camera will be at zero, zero, zero. And we say with th that camera. Um, I use context managers in order to send data into our shader, shader object. So let's draw the, the, uh, draw the object. And you'll see that it doesn't quite work. There's something else that's missing here. Instead, we get something that looks like this. It's close. It's something. It's not black. But uh, there's... <laughs> You know, for graphics, you know, something appearing on the screen is a good step. Um, there's a few things that's missing. One is that the monkey is way too big. Currently, we're inside its head, which, as a neuroscientist, is a good thing. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to bring that down to make him scale down to just one. Oops. 
and that didn't work for reasons I don't understand. But uh, let's make him even smaller. There we go. So now we have red background and crazy looking monkey in the middle. All that's left is to, uh, to turn on and off certain OpenGL settings to make sure every triangle is re rendered correctly. Um, and for that, I have some default states. These are called uh, OpenGL states. Default states. And we can bind them as well. And now we have our monkey. So we have a model matrix. We have view matrix. We have projection matrix. We got monkey. Everything's good so far. But how are we getting all these little colors and shadings? How does it look so 3D? Well, it all comes down to this shader. These sh uh, shader programs are programs that are run, uh, are, that are run on, on the, the graphics card. Hmm, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's see what else is on the slides. Oh, yeah. Everything's great. In old style OpenGL, you would you would set all the, the these matrices internally on the graphics card um, by calling one function at a time. You'd say scale the the object, rotate it, translate it, so on and so forth, starting with an identity matrix. But this was a lot of calls. Modern OpenGL looks like this. You have a shader program that act, where you have full control over the pipeline. Um, this program runs. This is a, called a vertex uh, shader. It's run once for every single one of these vert, uh, vertices, and you can pass data in, uh, into it so, um, from, from your CPU. In this case, a vertex shader is used to set where something is going to appear on the screen. And here's the algorithm for setting the, the, the model view projection matrix. We, we grab our vertex position data. All that we're using is this first one. And then we import the model matrix and view matrix and projection matrix from our mesh camera and projection objects. And then just multiply them together and output them into this default uh, variable called GL position. So that's what that's doing. Let's try it out. Oh, but in uh, Rat Cave, of course, and most game engines, you only have to do something like this, and it's doing it's kind of doing that for you. So let's make our own shader, our own OpenGL shader. Every sh uh, shader is made up of a minimum, a graphic shader is made up of a minimum of two, two shaders. First, the vertex shader, which is some string program in a language called GLSL. And then a fragment shader. The fragment shader runs, runs once for every pixel on your screen. And, um, just, a, it's great that, oh, uh, the graphics cards are so parallelized. And, the, and, uh, it looks something like this. Graphics, graphics shaders, uh, every program needs to run a main program. It looks like this. And the graphic shader needs to output a color. What color is that pixel? And this color is going to be blue. Red, green, blue, and not transparent. The vertex shader just declares where things are going to appear on the screen, the location. So we know which fragment shader, which uh, vertices appear at that fragment shader. The vertex shader always runs first and then passes data to the fragment shader. What I'm going to do is grab this vertex position data. This is a VEC4. This is X, Y, Z, W. It looks like this, vertex position. And then I'm going to get the, get the um, uniforms from um, from my camera mesh and uh, yeah, for my camera and my mesh. These are all 4x4 four four matrices. We have to define the type. It's not Python, unfortunately. Um, and they look like this. Model matrix, view matrix, and projection matrix. Uniforms are the pipe between our, 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 compute, our CPU and our GPU. This is all the data that's coming in. And then we use it inside our main program. GL position, then is defined as the projection matrix times, by default, it's, it's a matrix multiplication, times model matrix times vertex position. You can make that a new object by using Ratcave's shader object, vert shader, comma, frag shader. 
And instead of using the default shader, now we can use the shader object we just made. Now it's appearing. Everything that's not, that, that's not involved in the vertex shader is red, just like before, but now everything inside is blue. By modifying the fragment shader, we can do a lot more complex things. Common thing to do is something, the most basic algorithm is called Fong shading. And this all relies on the normal coordinate data, knowing what angle your surface is from that position. To, to make things look like this, you do what's called matte reflections or diffuse reflections. This is defined by the, the, the angle between the light hitting the, hitting the surface and the normal off of the surface. You take the, the dot product of this, the cosine of this, and you know exactly how, how bright it should be. Glossy specular reflections like this incorporate also where the viewer is in space. And then finally, we, we cheat a little bit by adding something called ambient reflections. This is supposed to simulate all the light bouncing around off of everything that we don't want to compute. When you add them all together, you get something like this. And by, by changing how much of each of these steps there are, you can get, uh, you can get, get a, get a realistic-ish simulation of different kinds of materials. So if you worked with uh, 3D graphics and you've selected a material type, this is, this is what you were doing. Um, I'm not going to demo this because I already demoed the monkey with the default shader. And I want to show you, um, really quick, uh, VisPy. I still have some time. VisPy um, looks very similar. It provides some, some OpenGL objects, a pro, a pro, what they call programs, which are shaders, and it, it, it provides an event loop called an app. You can use NumPy, just like this. To, and in this case, what they're doing is making some uh, time, time series analysis. And then you, you can write your shaders. You can write your attributes that you want to pass in. This is, the, this is exactly the variables that you want to send, send to your shader. You can, give your, you can give uniforms if it's the same value for every vertex. You write a frag shader to decide how it's going to look on screen once you, once you know where it's supposed to appear on screen. And then you make a canvas app. This is similar to that app object I made before. Pro, um, just like rat cave, uh, rat cave objects, you can use... Um, a dictionary interface to send that data directly to each of those programs. So this is actually setting it onto, onto your GPU. Once you, once you go to the on draw, see they've got on resize, on mouse wheel, there's all kinds of inputs that you can give. And these are the functions that are called when that happens. It will just call the program dot draw, uh, dot, dot draw command. And the cool thing about this is you can see just how, how, uh, whoops, that's not right. You can see just how, um, powerful you, uh, taking advantage of your graphics card is, especially when you know exactly what the output should be. This isn't this isn't my demo, by the way. This is one of the examples coming off of the the VizPy. So you can you can get this off the VizPy repository. I'm not a, a VizPy developer. Please don't don't get mad at me. This is a lot of signals happening all at once, and we can manipulate. Well, I I don't actually have a zoom button. I can't use my zoom on, on mine. But uh, we can get quite a lot. We can, we can show in real time, let's say 60 by 60 time series all at the same time on my, my crappy laptop. That's a lot of data all being, being shown in Python. It's because we took advantage of that whole pipeline and we took advantage of our graphics card. And of course, if you want to do some really kind of neat looking displays, you can do the same thing. NumPy, write your shader. This is de the vert shader describing where things are going to be on screen and what color they should be. Pass in the data. New explosion. And then run your application like fireworks.py and you get something like this. Pretty high performance. It's because Python doesn't have to make a lot of calls. All the work is being done by a graphics card because you've taken advantage of these shaders. Um, if you, if, so if you want really low level control or you want to write widgets that can, that can take advantage of your graphics card, it's not too hard to get started. And, and, and what, what I've described is, is, is all the essentials in order to, to make it pretty much any display from virtual reality to real time, time, uh, time series. Um, if you want to see what the, uh, the, the fragment shader for, for the Fong, Fong thing, the Fong, uh, algorithm is, it looks like this. The diffuse reflections are this dot product between your normal and your light vector. 
you have your specular reflections here, which incorporate the uh, which incorporate the uh, camera camera's position. So you've got the extra data, and then you've got your ambient reflections. Adding them up gives you your final color. In in Rat Cave or in VizPy, you just set you can just set all of these things using the default shader with a dictionary like interface. And that's the end of part one. I think we we have time for part two. Oh, I'll talk fast. Textures. I mentioned that you can take images and you can actually place them, uh, wrap them around 3D objects. And it's something I had to, had to figure out in order to project um, my pro project um, my project my object onto the the 3D arena for the rats. I've talked about vertex data x y z z. Three, three pieces of data for every position in space. I mentioned normal data. This is defining how light should interact with it. So you have six pieces of data, six floating points that are associated with every vertex. What we add in is two more pieces of data, these UV coordinates called the text coordinates. These define how an image should map on, should, should wrap onto that, that, uh, that object. You have one, you have one text coordinate for every vertex as well. So eight, eight floating points for each of these. And, you know, I think the globe is the, the, the best kind of example of this. We have a 3D globe. We have a 2D, 2D map. By defining what the UV coordinate of each of that piece of that image is, we can, we can associate with each vertex. And OpenGL will linearly interpolate between each of those points in order to produce the full image. On the graphics card, this isn't too bad. To, to, uh, you send the, the, the image data as a, what's called a sampler. You get your, your two, two, two coordinate texture coordinate. And then you just call a text, the function called texture 2D. This take, this gets you, takes the image and the texture coordinate you want. And you get the RGB values, the, the color value for, uh, at that position on, on your, on your, uh, image. And then you can do whatever you like with it. In this case, uh, in this case, I'm hiding it from everyone. There we go. I'm, uh, putting the, I'm multiplying it by the diffuse color. So that way we can, we can see an image. And uh, we, can, we can see the image at the same time as specular. In uh, Rat Cave, there's a texture object. At a lot of these, these OpenGL um, libraries, there's a texture or image object. And you can load that from, from any kind of image. Um, if you attach the, that as a, as a, on the texture attribute of any, of any of these objects, they get sent over as a sampler to, the, to your shader. And you can automatically load them, load them in. And... Uh, that's pretty much it. People will take advantage of this by not only loading from files, but they'll also generate their own files, uh, their own images, because that's what you're doing, right? You're, you're, you're rendering onto a 2D plane, but save them onto the internal buffer of the graphics card, and then render multiple images, and then run another shader to add to them up together. This is called multi-pass rendering or deferred rendering, and you can do a lot of interesting things that way, um, including uh, the uh, what Cave... Cave VR systems are doing called um, cube mapping. You render the world six times, one from six different perspectives, and then um, you, you find the UV coordinate of each of these images by translating it into the X, Y, Z vector from um, from the center of that cube. That gives you a color. Where what what brightness should that area of the world be from this direction? Some people will load in pre predefined images. This, like virtual reality tourism, is this algorithm. You take six pictures of a, of a famous place, you load it up, and then cube map onto, onto a perspective. It's profitable if you're switching fields. This is, this is a good way to go. If you can do movies, it's even better. And of course, you can, uh, you can do the same thing with your own pre generated, your online generated images. And, uh, and RatCave includes a texture cube object that works exactly the same way. Oh, a, a cube texture object, and there's a texture cube function that can that can get a that can get the color from from a cube map, and that's pretty much that. the um, The end result is that you can make all kinds of things. You can render things from perspective of any object because you can calculate its view matrix. You can, uh, in this case, I'm proje I'm projecting a 3D scene from I don't know our perspective. And at the same time, onto another object, I'm rendering a I'm rendering perspective of that 3D scene from the monkey's viewpoint. 
And we can see is that the, that the projection, um, is different from our perspective and their perspective. That the objects are much, the closer objects are much bigger when projected onto the screen and small, and smaller when they're far away. They even move opposite directions if they're on opposite sides of the screen, which is a little bit non-intuitive. Um, so, and this is just what I said. All that together is how I made the, the Rat Cave VR setup, and it's been a really great help to understand how 3D graphics work in general. And uh, I hope you, you've learned something about 3D graphics and um, feel more ready to, to experiment with it yourself in Python. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes for questions. Please uh, repeat the questions because I don't think we have a mic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, so my question is that uh, I have not really actively worked uh, with any of these libraries, but I understand that there's a lot of libraries for uh, gaming and uh, 3D visualization on the desktop. Mm -hmm. But what about the browser? I mean, this uh, web chain is so advanced, uh, all the games. Are so many games in the browser, but so far I've not discovered a Python library or something that lets me write Python code and then generates the web shell for me. Do you know something? Yeah, there's a there's a project called Brython that's that's trying to do exactly this. Um, but the uh, well, usually uh, like the bigger the bigger publishers are using bigger engines and just exporting it to WebGL instead of OpenGL instead. And so I haven't seen a Python project that specializes in WebGL, but because it's actually a subset of normal OpenGL, it's quite possible to do from the same libraries we just talked about. But it's, it's not something I have experience with. Um, in the absence of another question, I want to show you how to do animations, in case you haven't done callbacks. Um, you can also schedule functions to run in these, these applications as well. In this case, I have an update function that's going to run every single frame. This is another method on, on the application. And you usually give it the amount of time that's passed since the last time it was called. And what it's going to do is it's going to rotate the monkey 45 degrees per second every time it's called. And to schedule it to be called every single frame, um, what you have to do is you have to say schedule on the... Uh, on the uh, in the event loop, so piglet dot clock dot schedule update will do that for you. And you end up getting something like well, like this: update not defined. App dot update. Oh, but it doesn't work. So never mind. No. Let's initialize it. Call super, always call super. And now we can we can do all the scheduling uh, immediately. So and it still doesn't work. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> DT was supposed to be the seconds. Yeah, I'm not sure what was going on there. I stretched it too far. I was so so close to 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 a good live coding session, and then so sad. Anyway. Are there any issues with the depth perception? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, right right now we're just projecting from a single perspective. If you want to project from two perspectives. You, you'd have to put your camera in two different places. You'd have to do something like, you'd have to put your cam, camera, um, first to, off to the side, and then find it, and draw. And then maybe you would do it again, from the other position. This is reusing code, of course, so not nice. And without clearing the screen in between, you would um, you would draw twice. 
and they actually sum up on top of each other if you have the blend function set right. And if you set set the image to to only draw in red or only in in cyan each time you draw, you can actually make it work for red red green glasses and uh, red blue glasses, and it works quite well. So um, so once you've got that low level pipeline, you can just add each step, and it, it works. That's right. Absolutely. The uh, if I make if I let's 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 make some uh, empty mesh, some object. It has a rotation, right? And it, you're right. It's it's Euler, uh, It's in Euler degrees. We can convert it to quaternions quite simply. Um, this, and we can and we can actually and these are its its own objects. So you can actually reference x y z there. And even if you want to control it always from quaternions, you can set that um, the rotation to be that object. And now everything is defined in quaternions. Uh, it, and it works great. So this uh, usually your users want to control things um, using Euler coordinates because it's easier to kind of conceptualize. You want your tracking systems, and automated systems, and storage systems to store things in quaternions. And um, then, of course, your, and your graphics want to do matrix multiplication, so you, sort, so you send it in matrices. By being able to convert between all of them, you can make the best of all worlds. Thank you very much for your attention.